Man, I want, I want nothing more. I know Richie wants nothing more than us to be a church where people that are far from God can come in close and learn who God is, to, to come into a growing relationship with who Jesus is. Man, that's, that's our heart, that's our goal, that's our mission. We wanna point people to Jesus. And man, I'm glad to be a part of this church. Are you guys glad to be a part of this church? Come on. Well, last week, last week was awesome, right? Last week we celebrated 20 years, 20 years of ministry, 20 years of people being saved. I'm gonna keep going until people get excited. 20 years of people being baptized, 20 years of marriages being restored. Man, what an awesome week it was. It was a day of remembering or reflecting on all that God has done over those 20 years. And we closed our time last week um, coming together and praying over the next 20 years and what God has in store, not just the next 20, but the next 40, the next 60, and it's gonna keep going because God's got his hand on this place. And so we ended our time praying over what the next 20 years have in store. And we've had some great things happen. We highlighted those, we talked about those, we celebrated them last week, but man, greater things are to come. The best days are ahead. The best days are ahead of us and God's got some amazing things he wants to do immeasurably more than we ask and think and imagine. He's got some awesome things in store for us. And um, as I was planning on what to speak today, a couple weeks ago when it was on the calendar for me to speak, I, I had a different message in, in mind and God switched gears as I was actually studying for that message, uh, God opened my eyes to what he really had for me to speak to you guys today. And I'm super excited about what he has. And I think what he, what he showed me in scripture is fitting because here we are one week removed from our 20th anniversary, it's day seven. And I did the math of the next 7,300 days of the next 20 years, we're on day seven. So we're just starting out and God's got something I believe uh, that he wants to speak to each and every one of us today. Um, and I was studying the life of Jacob in Genesis and I was looking back, trying to uh, look at his father's life, just trying to get some context for what was going on in Jacob's life. And how, how many of you agree you can learn a lot about a son by looking at the Father, amen, you can learn a lot. And so that's what I was doing. I was looking back, I was looking back at Jacob's father, who was Isaac, I was looking back at his life, and I was trying to put together this message. It really wasn't really coming together. It wasn't really gelling, and then I learned why. It's because God didn't want me to speak that message. I am gonna speak that message one day, because um, it's good, um, and so, because I wrote it, no. Um, and so God said, no, not that, not that. This, this is what I want you to speak. And so as I was reading through the life of Isaac, I got to Genesis chapter 26. That's where we're gonna be today. So if you have your Bibles um, or if you've got your phone, you guys can go ahead and turn to Genesis 26. If you've got a pen or if you've got a highlighter, I can guarantee you there's some things you're gonna wanna highlight um, or take notes on the Bible app. I know we've got some big Bible app fans that they're always taking notes because I see it on my phone, you know? There's uh, accountability with the Bible app. I can see what you guys are reading. And so uh, that's really awesome. So Genesis 26, uh, let's go ahead and read that. If you don't have a Bible, if you don't have the Bible app, the words are on the screen, there they are. They're ready for us. Um, so let's read this. We've got a little bit of scripture here to read. It says this in verse 12. It says, Isaac planted crops in that land and the same year reaped a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him. The man became rich, that's Isaac. The man became rich and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. He had so many flocks and herds and servants that the Philistines envied him. So all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the time of his father Abraham, the Philistines stopped up, filling them with earth. Then Abimelech said to Isaac, Abimelech is the king of the Philistines. He said to Isaac, he said, move away from us. You have become too powerful for us. So Isaac moved away from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar, 
where he settled. And this is our key verse for today. Isaac, what's that word? Come on, that's your cue. Isaac reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of his father, Abraham, which the Philistines had stopped up after after Abraham died. And he gave them the same name as his father had given them. Isaac reopened the wells. Isaac reopened the wells. I want to speak today on open up the wells. Open up the wells. God, would you speak today just like you spoke this to me as I was studying, as I was reading. God, you revealed so much to me. You convicted me of so much. And so God, today I pray you do the same thing as you speak through me. Would you convict where you need to convict? Would you encourage where you need to encourage? And would you show us what you have for us today? God, I'm surrendered to you. I give you this time. I give you my words. I give you my body. I give you my mouth. Would you speak today? I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Ah, Open up the wells. So here's Isaac. He is living in the blessing of God. God is blessing the work of his hands. Isaac is settled in this land. He's, he's, he's set up camp. He's planted crops. He's putting down roots. He's raising his family. And God is blessing him. And this blessing that we see on Isaac's life is the same blessing that was on his father's life. The same blessing that Isaac had on his life is the same blessing that God put on Abraham, his father. And so just for a little bit of context, I know you're probably like, man, are we going to read more scripture? Yes. Yes, we're going to read more scripture because the word of God is powerful. Amen. Can I get an amen? The word of God is so, so, so good. And so we're just going to back up to the beginning of this same chapter, just for a little bit of context. It's about like one of those movies, you know, or an episode of your favorite TV show where it opens with like the end and you're like, man, I don't know what's going on. How did we get here? You know, and so that's what this message is going to be a little bit about. And so we're going to back up to the beginning of Genesis chapter 26 and read this. So it says this, Genesis 26 verse 1. It says, now there was a famine in the land besides the previous famine in Abraham's time. So there was a famine in the land, but it wasn't the same famine that Abraham encountered, but it was a famine. It was a famine. There was a famine in the land. And so uh, Abraham experienced a famine, and now Isaac is experiencing a famine. And so it was the same problem, just a different person. The same problem, just a different person. The same problem that Abraham had, now Isaac had. Abraham had a famine, now Isaac has a famine. And if you read on in scripture, Jacob also encounters a famine. And so same, same problem, just a different person. Same dilemma, just a different decade. And so it was a generational thing. Abraham had a famine, Abraham had a problem. Isaac had a famine. Isaac has a problem. And some of you here today, some of you here today, you're experiencing the same problem that your father had. You're dealing with the same issues that your father had or that your mother had. It's a cycle. It's a cycle. And then maybe your father is dealt with the same thing that his grandfather dealt with and then his father dealt with. It's been passed on through generations and generations. It's the same problem. Your father maybe had a drinking problem and now you have a drinking problem. You know, maybe your mother suffered with depression and now you suffer with depression. Same problem, different person. And for some of you here today, maybe, maybe this is just what you need to hear today, that no matter what your problem is, no matter what your dilemma is, no matter what your struggle is, maybe it has been passed down from generation to generation to generation, but today God wants to speak a word over you and say, hey, the cycle's going to stop 
with you because you might have the same problem that your father had or the same problem that your mother had, but here's the good news that we see in scripture is that on the other end of your problem is a promise. And some of you need to to know that today, you need to believe that today, and you even hear me saying that right now and you're like, I don't believe it. (laughs) You know, I don't believe it because I keep telling myself that I'm gonna get over this, that one day this is gonna be done, that one day this cycle is gonna end, but it never ends, it never stops. I just keep going back to the same old struggle, the same old sin, the same old thing, and, and you just believe that the cycle is never gonna stop, but God says, that you might have a problem, but I've got a promise. And some of you just need to hear that today. Maybe it's one person that's either here or whether you're joining us online, you need to hear that today, that on the other end of your problem, there's a promise. And so God gave Isaac a promise. Let's keep reading. So there was a famine in the land. It wasn't the same famine that his, his father Abraham was experienced, but it was a famine And it says this, it says, and Isaac went to Abimelech, the king of the Philistines in Gerar. And here's here's what I don't, here's what I don't get about this. And bear with me, I'm going to get through this. This is how I read scripture. You know, this is, this is how my mind works when I read scripture. Why did Isaac go to the king of the Philistines when he had a problem? We do that, right? Like we have a problem and we turn to everyone but God. God's sometimes our last resort. And so Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. And then look in verse two, it says, the Lord appeared to Isaac. Even though Isaac didn't go to God and seek help, God still appeared to him. I'm so thankful for the grace of God that he still shows up even when we're not seeking him out. Even when we're seeking help in all the wrong places, God still showed up. He, he thought so much of Isaac. He said, I've got great things in store for you. And so even though you're not looking for me, I'm gonna seek you out. And he appeared to Isaac. And this is what he said. Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and your descendants, I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father, Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed me and did everything I required of him, keeping my commands, my decrees, and my instructions. And look at this. So Isaac, what? Stayed. So Isaac stayed in Gerar. Isaac stayed in the place where the famine was because God told him to. God said, I know it's not easy. I know it doesn't look very promising right now. I know this is uncomfortable. I know this hurts. I know you're hungry, but this is the land that I tell you to stay in and I need you to stay. And I need you to stay and to stay in this land. See, see what, what Isaac wanted to do is he wanted to keep moving. He wanted to go to Egypt because in Egypt it looked like it was easy. But God said, no, I want you to stay in this land. I haven't given you Egypt. I haven't promised you Egypt. I've promised you this land. And so I need you to stay here even though it's uncomfortable. And sometimes we like to venture on into Egypt because it looks easy. But just because a famine comes, just because there's a problem at hand, we need to learn to stay where God tells us to stay. So God told Isaac, he said, stay here. Stay here like your father did. Obey me like your father did. Listen to me like your father did and stay here. And if you stay here, I promise I'll be with you. If you stay here, I promise I'll bless you. And so Isaac did it. He stayed. And God's looking for some people that will be willing to follow him no matter how hard it gets, no matter how uncomfortable it gets, no matter what happens, no matter whether you face famine, no matter whether you face insecurities, no matter whether you face job loss, whatever it is, God's looking for a people. He's looking for a group of people that are set aside that will listen to him when he says, stay. 
He's looking for some men that when God says, stick it out, I know divorce looks easy, but you need to stay and you need to work it out and you need to put some work into your marriage. Don't just run from it. You need to stay. God's also looking for some women, some women that will stay when God says to stay. He's looking for some youth and some students that won't just pursue what gets you the highest paycheck or the highest income, but pursuing what God has for your life, pursuing the direction he has for your life, pursuing the calling that he has on your life. Because here's the thing, if you stay committed to the call, God will bless you. God will bless you. And we need to learn to be committed to the call no matter the cost. Because it'll cost you, that's for sure. That's for sure. It hurt for Isaac to stay in this land. There was a famine, it was hard to eat. It was hard to survive, but God said, hey, if you stay here, I'll be with you. I'll be with you, and that's worth way more than eating really good, is being in the presence of God and knowing that he's beside you. And so God's looking for some people that will be willing to stay when he says stay. So Isaac stayed in the place that God told him to, and his obedience brought blessing. Despite the circumstances around him, God blessed him. And that's what we saw when we started reading our key text in verse 12 in in Genesis 26. It says, Isaac planted crops in that land. Because notice, notice, if you look back, God, God said, hey, stay, stay here. But if you also notice, he said, stay here for a while. This wasn't an overnight trip. This wasn't a weekend camping excursion. This wasn't a vacation. This was for a while. I need you to set up camp here. And what faith it took for them to do that But God blessed, and we see Isaac, he put down roots, he planted crops, and he stayed in the land. And that same year, he reaped a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him. So God blessed Isaac just as he promised he would. And as the blessings started to flow, the Philistines took notice. They took notice. And so when God starts to bless you, when God starts to bless me, when God starts to bless us, Hell will take notice. When God starts to bless, hell takes notice. And when you're surrendered to God's direction and plan for your life, here's, here's two things that are certain. When you're, when you're surrendered and you're committed to God's direction for your life, God will bless you. That's number one. And the devil will block you. <laughs> when you say, God, I'm committed. I'm committed to your calling no matter the cost, no matter what it costs me, no matter how much it hurts, I'm gonna stay committed. I'm gonna stay committed to what you have for me. There's two things that are for certain. God's gonna bless you. He's gonna come through on his promise. He's gonna make good on his word because that's what he does. And the second thing is the devil's gonna see it and he's gonna do everything he can to block you from the blessings that God's putting on your life. And that's what happened. The Philistines started seeing what God was doing in the life of Isaac and they stepped in to try to, to try to stop it. It said this in verse 15, it says, so all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the time of his father Abraham, the Philistines stopped up, filling them with earth. In order to try and block the blessings of God, in order to try to derail what Isaac had been promised, they said, well, I know what we're going to do. I know what we're going to do. We're going to go to all these wells that Isaac has, all these wells that his dad left behind for him, all these sources of life that, that Abraham left behind for Isaac, and we're going to fill them up. That'll show him. That'll shut him up. That'll stop God's blessing on his life. And so that's what they did. They went and filled in all the wells and these wells, these, these weren't the type of, yes, they were the same type of wells that we have today. They're, they're, they're sources of water, but they weren't just a uh, good thing on a house listing. This wasn't just a perk, you know. These wells were essential, essential to their survival. It was the source of water for Isaac and his family. They were a source of water for Isaac and his servants. They, they uh, watered their herds and their flocks with these wells. They were essential to their survival. They were a life source 
for Isaac. They weren't just, you know, it, they weren't just a luxury. They were essential. They were necessary. And so the Philistines are trying to shut off Isaac's life source. And I think there are several applications that we can learn through this story this morning. There's, there's, there's several things we can learn and take away and apply to our life this morning. And the first is this. You have to identify the Wells. I'm not talking about the Wells family. I'm not talking about Travis Wells who plays keys so beautifully every Sunday. I'm not talking about them. No, I'm talking about what Wells do you have in your life? See, we all have Wells that the previous generation has left behind for us in our lives. We all have wells that the, the previous generation dug for us in order to have life as we know it today. Maybe it's a father, maybe it's a mother. Maybe it's a mentor or a pastor that was there for you during a difficult season. Maybe it was a teacher, maybe it was a professor that helped impart wisdom into your life that got you where you are today, that helped you be the man, the woman that you are today. I don't know what it is. We all have wells in our life. And I, I know this, I have so many wells that my parents dug for me that I am a beneficiary of today. And they dug so many wells, and I am the man that I am today because of the wells that my parents dug for me. And I know my dad's going to be watching this. I'm just going to brag on him a little bit. You guys know my dad and, and my, my mother. They've been here. Um, they were back here this, earlier this spring helping us out with um, our doing our park campaign. But my, my parents, my father and my mother, they dug so many wells for me. And one that I always brag on is the well of stewardship. My parents taught me so much how to, how to budget my money, and not just budget my money, they taught me that it's God's money. That what God gives me is not really mine, it's his, I'm just a steward of it. I'm just responsible for it while I'm here, and I need to be a good steward of that which he blesses me with. He gives me the ability to work, he gives me the ability to get paid, and so therefore I need to be a good steward of it. And with that, they taught me how to budget my money, they taught me how important the tithe was, that that comes first, that that comes off the top, we don't give it last, we give it first. They taught me how to function with credit cards appropriately, they drilled that in from an earlier age, hey, you don't just swipe the card to get free stuff, it's not free money, no, if you don't have it in your bank account, you don't swipe the credit card. They taught me so much when it came to stewardship. They dug that well and they dug it deep because today, even when I'm paying bills to this day, I think about the stuff that they taught me and they dug that well and they dug it deep so then I could live and benefit from that which they worked so hard to instill in me. And we all have examples of that. If we were to sit and we were to think long enough, we could think back and some of us have more wells than others, that's okay, but we all have people in our life that have worked hard to get us where we are today and to try to set us up for success. And so first we need to identify our wells. There's, there's all sorts of examples of wells. There could be a well of generosity. It could be a well of joy. It could be a well of serving. It could be the well of stewardship, uh, forgiveness. Abraham, here's one well that... that, that Abraham left Isaac, and that was the well of faith. There's so much scripture written on Abraham and how he lived a life of faith and dependency on God. You think it's hard to have faith today when we have the Bible, when we have the whole story before us? Here's Abraham, the pioneer of our faith, stepping out from his family, stepping out from his country, pursuing what God is saying to do, and he had the, the, the gift of faith unlike any other and scripture, and scripture has so many, so many passages written on Abraham and how he had faith like none other. And he left that for his son Isaac. And we even see Isaac here in this scripture living out, living from that well of faith. When God said stay, he stayed. He had the faith. And as these wells in your life begin to bring blessing and the promises of God start to be fulfilled in your life, the enemy will come along and do everything he can to derail you. 
what, what those people that have come before us, what they've dug out, the devil's gonna try to fill in. What we dig out, the devil's gonna try to fill in. He's gonna try to block us. He's gonna try to derail us. But notice, notice this. This is, this is interesting. This is interesting. Notice what the Philistines stopped up the wells with. Look in verse, in verse 15. It says, so all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the time of his father Abraham, the Philistines stopped up, filling them with earth. Filling them with earth. Do we have that verse? Do we have that verse? Verse 15, Genesis 26, there it is. He fill, the Philistines stopped up the wells and he filled them with earth. And so in, in my research of wells and kind of how they functioned as, as I was doing that research in preparation for this message, there, there's all sorts of ways. People got creative when it came to, to stopping up wells. This was a common thing. Because if you, people fought over these wells, they, uh, they were a source of contention in this society and in this culture. And a lot of times they would maybe fill them in with sand or they'd fill them in with dirt. Maybe they would roll a rock over it or, or fill it with rocks. That was one thing they did. Another thing they would do, they actually take carcasses of dead animals and they would like put them in the, in the well or drop them down in the well and it would actually even contaminate the water source make it unusable. And so there was all sorts of, of ways uh, that they got creative in how they stopped up these wells. And I'll tell you, the devil gets creative in how he stops up your wells. He figures it out. He figures it out. And maybe you figure out a way to, to dig out the well, but then he figures out another way to fill it in. He'll figure out another way to fill it in. As I was studying this, I was reminded of the parable of the sower. In, in, uh, in the Gospels, Jesus told this story of a farmer that went out to, to sow his seed. And um, I'm going to just read this really quick. I think we have the scripture. We can put it up on the screen. Let's go read through this story really fast. Because I think this speaks into what we find in this story and how we can apply it to our life. It said this in Luke chapter 8. It said, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns which grew up and it was choked and it choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than what was sown. And this is what Jesus said. He said, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not. Mature, but the seed on good soil stands for those who have noble and a good heart, who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering produce a crop. And I thought about, I thought about this because I, I knew this story. Excuse me. I knew this story that the seed that fell among the thorns, right? The, the seed that fell among the thorns, it says that the, the, the plants started to grow, but they were choked out. And, and Jesus said that's because they grew among thorns and the things of this world, the worries of this world choked the plants, choked the life out of the plants and they couldn't grow, they couldn't mature. And here's the thing, by, by the Philistines stopping up Isaac's well, they were trying to choke the life out of Isaac. Because again, this wasn't just a luxury item that he had, this was his life source. Without it, he doesn't live. Without it, he doesn't survive. Without it, his kids don't survive. Without it, his flocks and his herds that God had blessed them with, they don't survive. He needed the wells to survive. And so the Philistines weren't just trying to annoy him. They were trying to kill him. They were trying to kill him. They were trying to choke the life out of Isaac. And here's the thing. The devil is a thief and a murderer. 
He's not out there trying to annoy you. He's not out there trying to bug you. He's not just trying to frustrate you. He's trying to kill you. He's trying to kill you. And if he can cut off your life source, if he can stop up your well, he'll do it because he'll know, he knows that you'll die. He knows that if, if he can cut off your life source, if he can stop up your well, just like the Philistines tried to do to Isaac, if he could stop up your well, he knows you'll die and you won't grow and you'll wither and you'll die. And he'll use whatever he can use to do it. He'll use worry, he'll use fear, he'll use anxiety, he'll use your finances, he'll use relationships, whatever he can get his hands on. He is creative and he's cunning and he's a killer. And he wants nothing more than for you to die. He wants nothing more than for you to die. That's what he wants. And if he can kill you, if he can cut off your life source, he will, and he'll find a way to do it. So notice, notice what Isaac did, and we read this earlier in verse 18. This was our key scripture for today. Isaac reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of his father Abraham which the Philistines had stopped up. So not only do we need to identify our wells, but the second thing we need to do is we need to reopen the wells. We need to reopen the wells that the devil has filled in. And it took faith, work, and commitment for Abraham to dig the wells decades earlier, and it was gonna take just as much faith, work, and commitment to reopen them again. Remember, these, these wells, they weren't a luxury, they were a necessity. So if Isaac was gonna live, he had to dig. And some of you need to know today that if you wanna live, you gotta start digging. If you wanna live, you gotta start digging. You wanna live, you gotta work. You gotta work at it. It's not easy but you gotta do it. And if you don't, you're gonna die. And I know that might sound bleak this morning, and trust me, there's, there's good news coming. <laughs> but some of you need to hear that today because you, the, the life is being choked out of you. <laughs> the devil's winning. He's filling in those wells that people have worked so hard to dig in your life and dig in my life. The devil's working overtime to fill them in. We got to dig them out. We got we to gotta reopen. We got to redig that which was once flowing with, with water, that which was once bringing us life and bringing us fulfillment and sustaining us. We're, we're withering and we're dying because the devil spilled in those wells in our life. And these wells, they were a source of water. And instead of Instead of your wells bringing forth life-giving water that only comes through Jesus, now they're just, they're dry. And they're not providing life and sustenance to you or those, in, those loved ones in your life. And Jesus said, whoever drinks the water that I give will never thirst again. He said that when he was talking to a woman at a well. <laughs> wells are important. Wells were important. And Jesus told that woman at the well, he said, Jesus, J Jesus said, whoever drinks the water that I give will never thirst again. And I thought about this. Hey, when you're, when you're really thirsty, what do you want most? Come on. When you're really thirsty, what do you want more than anything else? What, what ultimately satisfies your thirst? Water. Not Coke. Not tea, not coffee. Water satisfies. Water quenches the thirst. And when you're really thirsty and you got a choice, whether you grab 
a Coke or whether you grab a water. And I tell you, I, I love a nice ice cold Coke. There's nothing that will replace that with some meals. You know, you got a nice cheeseburger, you got a pizza, you know, some things just go better with Coke. Maybe that was even a slogan way back in the day. I don't know. Um, but some things just go better with a Coke. But when I'm thirsty, when I've been working outside in the yard, when I've been, uh, you know, depleted of my, the, the water in my body and I need to, to, when I'm thirsty, I don't want a Coke, I want a water. Because here's the thing, Coke has caffeine in it. Caffeine actually sucks the moisture out of your body. And, and the, the, the interesting thing is, is if you drink a Coke when you're dehydrated, you're actually causing the problem which you're trying to solve to get worse. You're just gonna constantly suck more and more moisture out of your body. And so when you're thirsty, when you're depleted, you need water. And some of you today, in your spiritual life, when you need to drink the water that only comes from Jesus, you're reaching for a spiritual Coke. And it may look good, it may taste good, but it's not good for you because it's sucking more life out of you. And there are some things in life that are good, but you can't live on it. You can't live on it. Some of you, you're trying to, to live off of those things that don't, don't bring life. You're trying to live off of Facebook and social media. You're drinking Coke because it's sucking the life out of you. And it's okay, it's okay if you counter that, if, you, if you're spending time in God's word, if you're, if you're seeking him, if you're, if you're spending time in his presence, it's okay to spend time on social media and Instagram and Snapchat and all these fun little things that are on our phone. But when you're not spending time with God, when you're not replenishing that which only he can provide for you, then you're spiritually dehydrated and you'll die. And you're trying, to, you're trying to quench a thirst with things that don't quench thirst. And that's what Jesus told this woman at the well. He said, hey, those that drink the water that I give, you'll never be thirsty again. And so these wells in our life, they provide that water that only Jesus can provide. But the devil tries to fill them in in order for us not to have that. And so we have to dig it out. We have to reopen the wells. And it takes work. I'm not telling you it doesn't. It takes commitment. It takes faith. But we have to do it. And it's worth it. Genesis 26, 19, after, after Isaac reopens the wells, it says this. And this is my last point. Isaac's servants dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water. Isaac's servants dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there. And lastly, Isaac identified the well, he reopened the wells, and he dug new wells. So the last point for us today is we have to dig new wells. We have to dig new wells. See, Abraham, he dug new wells for his son Isaac. He pioneered new territory. He took new ground in order to provide for Isaac so Isaac would have what he needs for his family in order to set Isaac up for success for what was to come in his life. Abraham, he did that. He dug new wells, and those are the same wells that Isaac is reopening, that the, de that the devil, that the enemy's trying to fill in. And now Isaac is doing the same thing. He's reopened the wells that already existed, but now he's digging new wells. He's taking new ground. He's finding a fresh source of water. This is, this is water that Abraham didn't even know about. Abraham didn't even find this. This was new water. This was fresh water. This was unknown. Isaac was pioneering new territory. He was taking new ground and he was building off of what Abraham had already started earlier. He was building on top of that 
So not only now do we have the wells that Abraham left behind, now we've got new wells that Isaac's digging. We're multiplying. We're, we're, we're uh, getting more and more wells because you can't just reopen the old wells. You have to do that. You have to do that, but you have to dig new wells. And there's a reason that I believe God showed me this, showed me this the other day when I was studying because like I said, here we are, we're one week removed from our 20th anniversary, celebrating all that God did and, you know, looking back and reminiscing and remembering and reflecting. But I believe God had a reason that he wanted to speak this over us today here on week one of the next 20 years, is he's saying there's new ground out there. There's new wells that have to be dug there's wells that you have in your life that need to be reopened to the, the life-giving source of, of, of water that only Jesus can provide. Yes, we need to reopen those wells, but I've got, I've got new wells out there, there for you to dig. I've got new territory out there for you to pioneer. I've got new ground for you to take. And there's fresh water out there that needs to flow down to the next generation. Because over the next 20 years, we're gonna see people in our church body rise up to take the mantle from us that are in leadership today, that are doing the things. We're gonna see our kids step up and, and start to lead in the same places that we've led the last 20 years. And if we're gonna do that, if we're gonna, if we're gonna see a move of God through this church and through this ministry, we've got to first reopen the wells that are in our life that the devil stopped up, but we've also gotta dig some new wells. We've gotta dig some new wells. There's this quote, there's this quote by Brian Houston. He's a pastor of Hillsong Church out in Australia. And I heard him say this at a, uh, a, a leadership summit that I watched one time and he said this, it's gonna be on the screen. He said, our ceiling should be the floor of the next generation. Success is setting up a platform for the next generation to win. Just let that sink in for a second. Just let that sink in for a second. Our ceiling should be the floor of the next generation. So where we stop, where we end up, is where they're gonna start. Let's not make them start where we started. Let's not, let's not take the wells that have been dug for us, all those resources that have been developed in us and given to us, let's not let those get filled in so then the next generation that comes behind us, they have to spend all their time opening up the wells that we left covered up. No, let's, let's reopen those wells mainly so you can survive and get through, but then can we dig new wells for the next generation that's coming so they have something to build off of, so they have a, a, a solid starting point, so they have a, a platform to be successful, to, to carry this ministry into its next season, to carry their families into what God has for them. May we set a platform of success for the next generation. Psalms 45 says this, it says this in verse 16, it says, your sons will take the place of your fathers. You will make them princes throughout the land. Now this is a messianic Psalm. It's talking about uh, Christ and the church, but I believe it speaks something to us today. That's very, very important. And this is what God is saying today, that today's sons are tomorrow's fathers that I'm talking to a room full of Abrahams and Isaacs are coming. <laughs> They're coming, they're coming. And right now, there's a whole bunch of Isaacs sitting back here, whether they're in middle school, whether they're sitting back there in the kids department, the Isaacs are coming. And what wells are you digging for them? Mom, dad, what wells are you digging? What will be the legacy that you leave behind for them to carry on? 
see, it's a race that has to be run. And the apostle Paul told Timothy this. Timothy was his spiritual son. Paul was a, a mentor to Timothy. And as Paul's sitting in prison, he writes a letter to Timothy. And he says, hey man, I've taught you all I can teach you. I'm writing these final letters to you. I finished my race. I've kept the faith. I've been obedient to the calling that God put on my life. And now it's your turn. Keep, keep running the race. Keep the faith. Keep pressing on. Pick up where I left off. Keep running. Keep racing. Be obedient to the calling God's put on your life. I'm not gonna be with you much longer, but you gotta keep going. And Timothy didn't start from nothing. Timothy started where Paul left off. And if anybody had it, <laughs> if anybody had a platform <laughs> to launch from, man, the platform that, that Paul left behind for Timothy, man. But Paul was obedient to the call and he set Timothy up for success and he set the example. He set the example for Timothy of what this needed to look like. And Abraham, as he left wells for Isaac, he set the example for Isaac of what a well was and how a well functioned and how, 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 how to dig wells. And, and here's, here's, here's the awesome thing as I was reading this, is by reopening the wells that the devil has filled in, the wells that the Philistines filled in, Isaac learned, <laughs> Isaac learned how to dig a well because the Philistines filled it in. If the Philistines hadn't filled in the well, he would have had nothing to redig. But because they filled it in, because of their efforts to try to cut off Isaac's life source, the opposite thing happened. Isaac learned how to redig a well. He got his shovel out and he started digging and he learned how to dig a well. And so he had to reopen the wells first so he knew how to dig the well. So then down the road, he could actually dig new wells for his kids. And some of you today, the devil's trying to cut off your life source. He's filling in your wells with, with anything and everything that he can get his hands on, anything he can distract you with, anything he can get his, your focus off of God and off of what Jesus is doing in your life, anything that he can use to get you distracted. He's trying to fill in your well. But what I'm saying, what I'm saying is he's going to take what the devil meant to destroy you and God's going to use it to restore you today. God's going to take what the, what the enemy meant for, for to kill you and he's gonna bring you back to life. And so you have to reopen old wells. So my question for you today, what wells do you have in your life that need to be reopened? What once was a well of life, a well of joy, that the devil stopped up, that it no longer brings the life it used to. Maybe it's, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's serving. I tell you this man, serving in God's house brings a lot of joy, brings a lot of life. And I know there's, a, there's heads that are nodding at me right now because you know what I'm talking about, but there's some of you that have stopped for whatever reason. Maybe you feel you're too busy. Maybe the calendar's too full. The devil's filled it in. He's filled it in. And it's not bringing you joy anymore. It's not bringing you life anymore. You gotta reopen those wells, what life or what wells do you need to reopen in your life? And then lastly, what wells do you need to dig for the next generation? What wells do you need to dig for the next generation? Here's, here, here's the last thing that I realized as I was studying this and preparing this. I don't, I don't know how much digging you've ever done with a shovel, but it's hard work. <laughs> 
If you're setting out to dig a well or dig a hole or dig anything, it takes a long time. It takes a long time to dig. It doesn't take very long to fill it in. It doesn't take very long to fill it in, but it takes a long time to dig it out. The devil's got the better end of the bargain. <laughs> doesn't take him very long to fill it in once it's dug out, but it takes a long time, takes a lot of effort, takes a lot of work to dig it. But it's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. And I would say the devil's winning. I would say the devil's winning right now. He's filling in more wells than we can dig out. He's filling in more wells than we can reopen. We gotta get to work. I was out in my storage shed the other day and I, I needed my shovel for something and I, I had to get a bunch of cobwebs off of it. I had to, you know, dig it out from underneath some different things and it was in the shape it's in because I don't use it very often. There's a lot of spiritual shovels that have gotten rusted, got cobwebs all over them because we stopped digging. We gotta start digging. And every time, every time a, a small group leader sits down with their kids, back in kids or in middle school or in high school or any of you that are small group leaders, anytime you sit down and you lead others, wells are being dug. Anytime you pray with your kids, wells are being dug. Anytime your kids see you worship, anytime you get your kids up early on Sunday and you come to church, wells are being dug. Keep digging. If you wanna live, you gotta dig. We gotta dig. We gotta get to work. It's too important not to. Father, we thank you for, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for all the people that have come before us that have dug wells on our behalf, that have left us a starting point for us to carry on. And so God, today, today, would you show us, would you show us those areas of our life that the devil stepped in and he's filled in with meaningless stuff. He's filled in with the things of this world. He's trying to choke the life out of us. But today, would we go to the storage shed? Would we get out our shovel? Would we dust the cobwebs off of it? And would we go out and would we get to work? Would you help us to reopen the wells in our life that the devil has filled in? Would you help us to find new territory and new ground to start digging so we can create new wells for the next generation that is coming up behind Behind us, Would you help us to set a platform for the success of the next generation? God, would you pour out a blessing on your people? Would you pour out a blessing on your church like you've never done before? God, would you help us to get to work, to have the faith, to be committed to the calling, no matter the cost, no matter how much it hurts? God, would you help us to do that today? God, would you do that today? Would you show us? Would you show us? Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.